Hi, everyone. I'm Greg Masters, Managing Editor of SC Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to our webcast, Detecting the Stealthy Attacker, Who Can You Trust?, sponsored by NetIQ. Our speaker today is Matt Mosley, the Senior Product Manager at NetIQ. Matt has more than 15 years of experience in engineering, consulting, and management positions with technology companies. He is a founding member of the ISP Security Consortium, holds several certificates, and is a frequent speaker at security conferences. Breaches into the networks of major corporations and government agencies are only growing more prevalent. Each week seems to bring news of the theft of another huge batch of personal records. Organized cyber gangs and nation-state actors are continually probing and siphoning off assets to be sold on the black market. Disgruntled insiders, no longer beholden to ethical boundaries, abuse their privileged access for personal gain. On top of that, misconfigured security tools and human error allow further intrusions. But there are remedies. In this presentation, Matt will discuss new techniques for protecting sensitive data and mitigating risk, and how these approaches differ from tra traditional solutions. So without further delay, let me turn it over to Matt Mosley. Welcome, Matt. So glad to have you here today. Thanks a lot, Greg. I'm going to start out by talking a bit about where we are today in the current state of uh, the information security profession. Um, as you can see from this slide, unfortunately, we're not doing very well at the moment. Based on their research, Verizon Business has identified more than 900 breaches over the last six years that resulted in a net loss of about 900 million records of personal information or sensitive data. These include things like credit card numbers, personally identifiable information about individuals, and sensitive corporate information. If you dig into Verizon's data a little bit more, you'll see that 70% of these records were compromised by attackers who were outside the corporate network, yet 48% of the breaches were caused in part by insiders. How do we get to those numbers? Well, part of this is that malicious activity by insiders um, is not the only source of these type of attacks. Unintentional actions, such as malware infections or accidental loss of a hard drive, can also result in significant losses. Keep this in mind as we focus more on how to prevent these kinds of losses. Perhaps the scariest statistic in nearly all of these breaches is that almost all of them could have been detected or even stopped if some basic security best practices were in place along with effective monitoring. So is the problem a lack of technology? Based on a Harris Corporation survey, the majority of all large enterprises own tools like security information and event management solutions endpoint security products, and log management. Yet somehow, despite having these systems in place, we still seem to be unable or prevent these types of attacks. The same survey, in fact, indicated that more than two-thirds of all large enterprises have suffered losses due to things like system errors and misconfigurations or unintentional mistakes, again providing more evidence that not all breaches or outages are caused by external attackers. Malware has been an ongoing problem that seems to be growing in scope every year and is responsible for many of the largest and most public breaches that have occurred in the last five years. But things like lost or stolen equipment and insider data theft continue to be huge problems for our industry. So if we have the right technologies in place and yet we're still failing to protect our important data, what are we missing? Well, part of the problem is that the profile of an attacker has shifted over the last decade or so. Instead of the once uh, common lone wolf attacker sort of walking the streets of the Internet knocking on doors, we're now faced with what's been called the advanced persistent threat attack. The typical profile of an advanced persistent threat involves a dedicated patient attacker that's often well-funded and part of a larger group. These organized hackers are creating custom malware and using sophisticated attacks that often involve zero-day exploits which can't be detected through traditional signature-based intrusion detection technology. In order to detect these types of attacks, we need to consider a new approach. Traditional approaches to security have focused on the perimeter, on keeping the bad guys out and allowing the good guys on the inside to work inside a trusted environment. Firewalls and intrusion detection used together provide a good layered defense against attacks that originate outside the perimeter 
and log management and SIM technologies gather evidence and provide a means to filter out the noise. For the most part, this type of approach is effective at stopping attackers who are trying to uh, breach the network from the outside using things like published exploits. Unfortunately, modern technology has created a very loose perimeter, allowing attackers with the latest tools like this paraglider to simply go around those traditional defenses. Virtualization and cloud computing have provided great benefits to business when it comes to reducing cost and enabling just-in-time computing, but they've largely done so with security as an afterthought. Most of us are using our Blackberries or iPhones to access email, work on presentations, and access data that once would have only been available to us after we passed by the security guard at the front desk. And even if we can secure all of these holes in the perimeter, very few networks prevent insiders from going out to the Internet, which opens us up to browser-based attacks and malware that can open a back door to let the bad guys in without the in trusted insider even knowing it's happened. Do you know who has the keys to the kingdom? We all need administrators to manage our systems and applications. Unfortunately, most large networks have a very difficult time managing entitlements and ensuring that individual administrators only have the minimum set of privileges needed to do their jobs. Worse yet, when people change jobs, leave the company, or are given temporary administrator credentials in an emergency, those privileges are often not fully deprovisioned. Why is this a problem? In most cases, administrators escape the type of auditing that would detect someone accessing unauthorized data or making unmanaged changes that could result in a breach. It's hard enough to detect an attack when you focus on what users shouldn't be doing. If you sound the alarm every time an administrator changes a system file or accesses a database, the security team would never be able to investigate all of them. The inevitable outcome of trust of exempting certain individuals from the same rules that apply to everyone else is that eventually someone will get compromised, either knowingly or unknowingly. Social engineers have used trust to get around security procedures for many years. Today it's even easier because you don't even have to convince the trusted party to let you in the door. Let's say one of your sysadmins is on the web looking for a holiday gift for their spouse. They get redirected through a DNS attack to a fake website that looks exactly like the real one and click on rich content such as Flash to get a picture of the item they want to buy. The attacker who knew their buying habits and set up a scenario can now use their browser to take over their machine, installing a backdoor that will let them in unnoticed without the user ever knowing this has happened. When the admin's account changes a minor setting in a system configuration file that opens up a backdoor into the network, how will you know? What, what happens when the same account opens up a file containing important customer data? The problem has become prevalent enough that there's been talk of moving to a model called zero trust, in which we treat everyone the same. Unfortunately, it's often hard to go into a presentation with management and talk about how you want to move an organization to zero trust without someone in the room feeling like you're taking security a bit too far. Instead, I like to use the term trust but verify. Instead of exempting trusted users from monitoring, we should watch what they do and see if it matches their usual profile of behavior. A user from HR accessing employee data is probably normal, but that same user accessing credit card numbers when they're not usually associated with billing wouldn't fit their profile. A systems administrator should certainly be able to change system settings to maintain availability and keep the system secure, but should that same admin be reading or modifying application data files for things like billing applications? If they don't have the approval of the application owner, probably not. Instead of one-size-fits-all monitoring, we need to focus on what happened, who did it, and whether or not it presents a risk. Traditional Security Information and Event Management, or SIM, solutions focus on event correlation, looking for a known pattern that could indicate a vulnerability or breach. Where event correlation can fall short is identifying activity that doesn't appear to represent a threat based on known threat history. Anomaly detection fills this gap by identifying activity that's not necessarily bad in and of itself, but is unusual or outside the norm of behavior for a given individual. Alone, either of these approaches only tells part of the story, but used together, they provide a powerful ability to detect potential threats. The most important aspect of security event management is context. The most common complaint about security event management solutions is that they provide too much information 
and don't narrow the data down enough to focus the security team on potential problems. After a while, analysts learn to ignore much of what they see and look for things that are outside the norm. Unfortunately, as in the story of the boy who cried wolf, this can often mean that they ignore data that would have pointed to an actual breach. By integrating additional context about security events, we can reduce the noise and the false positives without creating false negatives. Someone changing their password in and of itself doesn't necessarily represent a problem. However, if the database application user on a system changes their login password, and that system has databases which are associated with billing applications, you might want to take notice and investigate further. Where all of this is leading us to is the concept of enterprise security intelligence. Enterprise security intelligence it starts by monitoring data from hosts, applications, network devices, and databases. The more data you have coming in, the better the output of the analysis. We integrate that data with environmental context. Identity management systems link the user ID to an actual carbon-based life form. Asset information tells us the value and importance of the systems and applications while linking this to business objectives and compliance mandates provide important information to help you assess the impact of a breach. When you take all of this data together and analyze it in context, it can provide the basis for meaningful analysis and ultimately real-time visibility into our security state and the business risk associated with threats. The benefits of security intelligence are numerous and include the ability to align spending to business objectives, identify potential risk to compliance mandates or security policy, and most importantly, identify threats before they can turn into significant loss. With the right data and the right approach, we can finally get ahead of the attackers. If you'd like to learn more, please go to our virtual booth where you can complete our survey for the chance to win an Apple iPad 2, chat with our product experts, download analyst research reports like the um, Build Security Into Your Network's DNA, the Zero Trust Model from Forrester Research, view customer case study webinars such as an, a case study from NRG Energy about secure user provisioning, and access informative white papers, including Address the Insider Threat of Privileged Users, co-authored by Dr. Eric Cole. Thank you very much, and we'll be happy to uh, take your questions following the presentation. Okay, thank you, Matt, uh, for a great presentation. Um, we're going to put out a poll question now for our audience to get your intake on what is your biggest information security challenge? And you can respond, A, monitoring privileged users, B, monitoring unmanaged unman change, C, log collection and aggregation, D, managing user privileges, or E, other. Okay, let's give you out in the audience another minute to vote in the poll. Meanwhile, we can ask Matt one of your questions, and I want to remind everybody this time to email Matt any questions via the interface, and uh, I think we have a few minutes to get to some uh, good number of questions. So one that's come in, what are the best security controls to put in place if I want to defend against advanced persistent threats? Thanks, Greg. That's actually a great question. And um, you know, the challenge with identifying um, and preventing advanced persistent threats from, uh, from becoming a problem in, in an organization is that um, many of these attacks involve threat vectors that are different from the sort of traditional network-based attack. And so um, you know, malware is the most common vector of, um, of exploits that, that we're seeing leveraged today. And because a lot of these exploits are, are zero-day attacks or things that you know, haven't been seen before in the wild and can't be easily picked up with signature-based detection, it's really important to understand um, and, and be able to monitor what users are doing inside the environment, privileged users in particular. Um, you know, we find that uh, you know, in privileged user activity, monitoring things like key system files and looking for changes that you know, 
might otherwise be normal except for the fact that they either didn't go through a change control process or you know, were done by an individual that normally wouldn't be making a particular type of change is one of the best ways to identify that something unusual is happening in the environment. You can't look at advanced persistent threats and, and you know, these type of um, you know, multi-vector zero-day attacks as something that is, is strictly detectable as, as a you know, static sort of attack. You have to sort of look at what's normal, what behavior is occurring, and whether or not that's outside of what would normally be acceptable. And, and so it's really important to have you know, monitoring um, inside your network. And while we talked a little bit about you know, zero trust models or limiting trust, it, it's really important to you know, think about insiders as being potentially equally of concern as people coming out. I'm recording. OK. My I'm sorry. Um, are you done there? Yeah, I'm done there. I think. Oh, helps. sorry. Okay. Um, we got the polling question results in, and it looks. The question was, "What is your biggest information security challenge?" And it looks like a third of respondents said log collection and aggregation, followed by managing user privileges, received 22 percent, and then third was monitoring unmanaged change at 21 percent, and trailing. Behind those, monitoring privileged users and other both received about 11 percent. So, Matt, is that something that uh, seems ordinary to you? Um, it does, and I, I, I continue to find it interesting that such a large number of people cite log collection and aggregation as a challenge, despite the proliferation of solutions out there. You know, from from SIM and log management technologies to you know even open source solutions that are that are available. You know, this is a problem we've had for a long time, and, and it's really been difficult to overcome. And I think one of the reasons it's been such a persistent challenge is that um, just collecting the logs isn't enough. You know, it's very easy to end up in a scenario where you have information overload, where you've got a lot of data from a lot of different places, and then the struggle is, how do I make sense of it? And so I think it's important when you're considering deploying log management or SIM solutions that you make sure that the, the product you select and the implementation plan you have takes into account um, you know, a, a focus on what are the most important things I want to identify as potential risk, potential problems. How does that apply to the policies I have in place, to what my network looks like, to what my core business applications are? And, and doing that work up front will really help in making those type of technologies much more effective at solving some of these problems. OK. And then uh, we have a few more questions that have come in, Matt. Um, can't endpoints use application whitelisting, hardened browsers, et cetera, to be less susceptible to the APT, APT threats that you mentioned earlier? And I think that's a great point as well. You know, one of the things I didn't mention earlier um, was tool, tools like application whitelisting. I think that's a space that is going to continue to grow and become more prevalent um, as a security technology. And, and the benefits are obvious, right? It goes back to the idea of um, of you know, not not really focusing on what is abnormal, you know, and trying to detect things that are abnormal, but saying, okay, this is what's allowed to happen. You know, these are the applications that should be running on my system. If anything other than these applications appears, or if anything changes with these core applications, then that shouldn't be allowed to happen, and we should stop it. And the thing about application whitelisting products is they tend to operate in one of two modes: either a blocking mode where they prevent any anything from being installed, anything from being changed that's not approved, or a notification mode where if something happens that's a violation of the policy, they send an alert for someone to look at and respond. And, and what we've seen is a lot of people are deploying these technologies today in more of the notification mode because of the risk. You know, there's always that trade-off between security and, and you know, business operations, right? The risk that there's an emergency, I have to put a new software patch on, and I don't want this application whitelisting technology to prevent that. But I think people are going to become more and more you know, warm to and comfortable with these solutions. And I think we're going to see them continue to expand in their scope because they are one of the best ways to prevent malware from becoming a problem in the environment. OK, thanks, Matt. I hope that answered your question. Uh, there's another one for you, Matt. Given the extent of custom malware, does it make sense to focus on data exfiltration? And yeah, I think it definitely does. You know, the the challenge I think with this space, and I go back to some of the things I mentioned about SIM, is that there are some good products in the in the DLP space, in 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 you know that that focus on monitoring what data is leaving the environment. The challenge is they tend to be somewhat 
um, time consuming and, and costly to, to deploy and, and really see the value from. And, and I, I think there's great products in that space and, and products that if you can invest the time to figure them to make sure that you know you're you're able to identify what data should be leaving what data shouldn't I think they can be very very effective and so I, I do think that's that's another area that's worth looking at I you know the the problem is a, a really savvy attacker and, and some of the the APT type attacks we're seeing are by well-funded organizations that have a focus on a particular type of information from a particular business or government agency you know they're going to be smart enough to also you know do things like encrypt the data when it's leaving, make it difficult, you know use non-traditional paths for getting data out of the environment, and there's some some doubt about whether or not you'd be able to easily pick that up. So um, I think that that's one layer in a in a layered approach to security, and I think that those products do have value, but I think you need to look at also um, you know protecting the the information assets themselves as well as having really good monitoring in place to identify behavior and activity that's not normal. Okay, thanks. And someone's written in, what types of security technologies work best in enforcing access control by insiders? Um, you know, access control is one of the toughest things, I think, for, for security professionals because, you know, it comes back to, uh, you know, the fact that businesses don't, don't work, aren't static, right? So there are new applications coming in all the time, especially as we start to see people moving things to the cloud. Um, you know, it's difficult to centrally manage and identify an individual, a person, and say this person's role in the organization is, um, you know, a billing administrator. So these are the access. This is the access they should have. How do we enforce that across all the applications, all the systems that we have within the organization, even if some of those are potentially, you know, outsourced as well? And so I think there are some really good technologies there. Um, identity management is certainly one aspect of that: is being able to um, track entitlements to to a person, and then you know, employ and, and manage those entitlements across all of the different business applications that exist. Um, you know, I also think in terms of access control, you know, it's important to make sure that you have um, solutions in place that cover the entire scope of your IT environment and, and realizing that, you know, most of us have heterogeneous environments and, and again, with, you know, virtualization and cloud, it makes it even more of a challenge. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, there are a number of technologies in this space, but the real challenge is making sure that you can um, identify and manage roles and assign those to individuals because trying to manage this problem at an individual asset level and individual users on a system is just impossible. Got it. Okay. Are there any further questions from the audience? We have another minute or two. Um, give you a chance to type in your question. Otherwise, um, to let you know, we can cyber escort you were to the Net IQ booth uh, when we're finishing up, and you could ask questions there of, uh, of Net IQ reps. And Matt, are you going to be in the booth as well? Uh, yeah, I believe I will be over there as well. Okay. So if there are no more questions, um, let me thank Matt Mosley at Net IQ for a terrific presentation, and thank you and our audience for tuning in. The uh, entire presentation will be available uh, beginning tomorrow on demand on the SC Magazine website, so you can uh, download that. And we'll get you over to the NetIQ booth. Thank you, Matt. All right, thank you.